Mansi and I'm from Bureaus. Today we have Rajendra Nath Roy with us. His new book, Kundalini Yoga and Mystery of Meditation, is out, and we are here to know what made him, what inspired him, and to write this book, and what was his thought process. We are very curious, and to let you all readers know, we are here with him. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining us, for letting us come here and talk to you. So my first question would be, what is quantum yoga, mm -hmm. and your med mystery of meditation all about? First, let me tell you what is yoga, before you come down to what is quantum yoga. All right? Yoga, in a very simple word, is combination of two things. Two plus two is a four. Yes, is a yoga. Every child who has gone to the school would know it. That two plus two is four, and it is known as addition. It is also known as yoga. All right. Um, in human life, there are two important things uh, that we confront. One is why the body suffers, the affliction of the body, whether through disease or through old age. That's common. And the other is how to control my mind, because mind is very wavy. It switches very fast. It moves very fast. So control of the mind and affliction of the body is the primary objective of any conscious human being to know the method how to control these two things. So here is yoga that comes in. Every act that you do, every act that you do. To make yoga, you need two things. Any two things can make yoga, or more than that. So, in this case, any act that you do, if it is combined with your consciousness, then it becomes yoga karma, karma yoga. And if the same act is without knowledge of your consciousness, then it is just karma. So the emphasis in yoga is anything, any action, any thought process that you entertain, it must be combined with your consciousness. Right? Now, the question is why quantum? You see, quantum is a word we have borrowed from the world of physics. In the world of physics, there is a very famous combination, quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics primarily deals with the subatomic constituents that is believed to be the important ingredient of the whole universe. Everything that is contained in this universe, which can be manifested or not manifested is based on the theory of quantum mechanics, which precisely in one word says that everything in this world is nothing but energy or its manifestation, right? And yoga, in its basic principle of, can you continue? Yes. Yoga, in its precise principle of understanding, has eight stages yam niyam asan pranayam pratyaha dharana dhyan and samadhi these are the eight limbs as propounded by the great sage patanjali now in this the most important is the pranayam pranayam is the link of the preceding three and the following four Right? Pranayam is nothing but an art and science of acquiring cosmic energy in your body. The constitution of the body is such that every cell 
every subatomic particle, every bacteria, it needs energy to survive. The moment you are short of energy, you will have some abnormality in the body. Either the system fails, or some component of the system fails, or you have tingling in the hand, or tingling of the leg, or feet. So energy is the most important component as far as the yoga is concerned. It, it combines the physical world and the, leads you to the spiritual world. So I wanted to fuse the world of science with the world of yoga, and I called it quantum yoga. Um, then the next question, of course, follows is why mystery of meditation? Right. Most of you uh, have come across that more or less today there is a mushrooming of yoga centers. And at the same time, everywhere on the logo that you see yoga center, there is a word meditation, which gives a feeling as if yoga is meditation and meditation is yoga. This is a myth. Because meditation is the ultimate stage of yoga. Ultimate. It's a very tedious process. Uh, and I wanted through my book to convey to the people that if you are not well prepared with your system, both physical, physiological and mental, if you are not well prepared to provide the energy that will emanate, if at all you get into the stage of meditation, you cannot absorb it and you can harm yourself. So I am trying to bring some consciousness in the mind of the people that meditation is the ultimate stage of yoga. People start with the People think we can start with meditation, that is yoga, which is a great mistake. And that is why the title Mystery of Meditation has been given. Well, so I never had so much, uh, you know, even in my family, there are many people who do yoga, you know, uh, in many apartments there is a ground and you know, all people gather and do yoga. But uh, the depth of knowledge that you acquire, I am very thankful that I could get this opportunity to learn this through you. Thank you. Now, sir, you've been doing yoga and you've been practicing it from past three decades. Mm -hmm. So now, even like with the practice and everything, like did you research something or was it all your pure knowledge and your learning that you poured into this? Precisely, uh, look. It, I saw people very close to me, very close to me, suffering. And uh, the suffering was very painful. Medicine, of course, was one answer, but medicine could only extend uh, the life or perhaps give some temporary relief. But it could never give the quality to life. And that disturbed me a lot. Because I had, I was involved not only in seeing them and sharing with them, I was also involved in nourishing them. It was very painful. See, to see their pain uh, uh, was extremely unbearable to me. And then I started looking for what, what is the alternative to modern medicine. And my mind went across a book uh, by B.K.S. Iyengar. Light and Yoga. I picked up that book and I read it from beginning to end a couple of times. And some part of it I picked up and I said, let me try this, particularly the pranic part of it. Because life is nothing but prana. In fact, the whole universe is nothing but prana. If the prana is not there, the world is collapsed, finished. So I focused on this. And I started practicing it, reading it, understanding it, and practicing it. Just to ascertain that is it true that you can benefit from it? And as I advanced over a period of time, I started feeling 
lot of change. First change was a healthy loss of appetite. I could, because my energy level was always good enough. The second thing was a gradual distraction or less attraction to the worldly affairs. I'm not interested. And this I wanted to pass on to those who are suffering. And they started feeling that, yes, they are getting relief, but the system is already too damaged. What is dead cannot be made alive, but what is still in the process of dying, you can still retain it. Then I extended my reading to more and more books and more and more experiment on myself. And over this period, in the meantime, there, there were some tragedies in, in my personal life. Lost my wife because of the sickness and ailment. And many other individuals in the family. So this made my belief more and more firm that this is the answer. If I cannot have total affliction-free life, at least I can extend my life without affliction. Maybe at some point in time, I can get affliction. And uh, I can confirm with, based on my own experiences, that it has worked very well for me. And it has also worked well for the people whom I have advised to do it. And that is briefly what I can tell you about it. That yes, I've read many other books um, besides Anger, but he is my main anchor writer on yoga. I've read uh, Yoga by Vasist, Yoga as propounded by Lord Krishna and Gita. Uh, I've read uh, Shwet Marma's uh, yoga philosophy. I've read Vivekananda. But all of them ultimately concentrate on one thing. You know, the most difficult thing in life is to understand yourself. Yes. And yoga teaches you that. And if you can understand yourself, you can understand God. It sounds easy, but the process is very difficult. So you can go ahead. This is a little brief I can tell you. We can talk about it. Uh, a very long time but you, you know in, in these things it's not the philosophy the argument and the uh, the various uh, intricacies uh, and the word jugglery that is important what is important in this is if you understand it assimilate it practice it doing is the only answer you know an idea and a philosophy has a value till it can be converted into action once an idea becomes action, idea is not needed. Then action is needed. If somebody teaches you an art of painting or an art of doing something, till the process that you are learning it, that skill is needed. But once you have learned it, then you need to practice it. Then you don't need the idea, you need the practice. Similarly in your, you have to practice it. The worst enemy of yoga is laziness. Gap, not today, tomorrow. No, don't do it. Don't do it. These are, my book is a very simple explanation of how do you proceed to do yoga, particularly in the pranayama portion of it. Other portions have also been done. In the most simple way, and a step by step explanation, do it feel it and if you like it and it gives you some advantage continue it if you have a problem call back consult and see where things are going wrong okay so now i want to know like every writer like there are like many that i've learned but there are few people that i want to write and there is a very uh, minor difference given that from their normal life to how they are as a writer so, what is the difference between Rajendranath Roy as a normal person and, different, and with Rajendranath Roy as a writer? Is there any difference that you see, that you, um, you know, understand about yourself? Uh, that's a very interesting question, my dear. 
Uh, look, Dian Roy as a human being is an average human being, full of vices, full of arrogance, full of ego, full of I, I did this. But when I think Dian Roy as a writer, when I sit down to write, uh, I start self-doubting myself. That it, is, is it so little that I know? I become more humble. I more, become more dedicated. I feel the world knows more than me. So I think I'll prefer to lead a life of B. N. Roy as a writer than B. N. Roy as a normal human being. Following up to this question, I would ask that every writer has a different atmosphere of writing. Some like writing in cafes, some, you know, isolate themselves in a room, some like writing in nature. So what is your atmosphere of writing? Where do you like writing? Well, this place can be any. Uh, place doesn't bother me. Uh, but in two simple words, I'll say uh, solitary silence. That's all I'd say. So, a lot of new writers today, they often suffer from the question that why do they write? And if they get the answer, like why do they write, then how to write? Then if they know how to write, then what to write? So, what is your tips and tricks for the new writers that they are coming on board? Like letting them know that this can help them write more quickly. I'll only share my opinion, but uh, there is no uniform answer for these things, I believe. One, you must have a passion. Passion for reading uh, on whatever subject that you like, but you must have first a passion for reading so that you acquire various thought processes in you. Uh, and you see what really suits you, what is acceptable to you. And from there on, you can expand your own if you have anything of your own. So first thing is the passion you must have about reading on the subject that you like to write. And um, writing pri primarily is for self-pleasure, self-satisfaction. Self so those who write primarily to please others, then they are not writers. Then they are, yeah, they are social people. They are writing for others. But writing primarily should be done for yourself. There is, you know, I remember, uh, it's a very good question you have said, you know, Ram Siddhith Manas by Tulsi Das. There was a lot of controversy on his book and uh, because the established authorities and the pundits of that time, they were not very comfortable that this book is getting so much of prominence. So, they wanted to play all kinds of tricks to downplay it. And uh, in one instance, Tulsi Das writes in his initial book, Swanta Sukhai Tulsi Raghunatha Gatha Bhasha Nibadra Mati Mandula Matma. Please don't bother about this book. I have not written for anybody else. It is for Swanta Sukhai. It's for my own pleasure that I have written this book. Swanta Sukhaya Tulsi Raghunatha Gatha Bhasha Nimadna Mati Mandula Matma. So a writer must write for his happiness, for, for his pleasure. Unless he is satisfied himself, he cannot satisfy the others. But sir, as a writer, don't you think we can never satisfy ourselves? No, that is why it's a progressive thing. That is why every, every moment you are learning something new. Well within. Well within you, you see yourself. Most of us have a weakness of looking outside. And we never look. I want him to be benevolent. I am. I want him to be charitable. I want him to sacrifice life, but not my own. There is a very good couplet I can tell you. Apne andar jhakke paale surage zindagi. Apne andar jhakke paale surage zindagi. Apne andar jhakko to sahi. 
बहुत चीजें मिलेंगी द होल कॉस्मोस इज विद इन यू यू डोंट वांट टू अंडरस्टैंड योर सेल्फ बट यू वांट टू अंडरस्टैंड एवरीबॉडी एल्स सो दैट्स व्हाट आई विल से अबाउट इट आई यूजुअली राइट Yes, I must confess yes. But what has sustained me is the patience and perseverance. Because uh, otherwise you can't write it. When you have an interactive agency to accomplish your mission, because it's just not me that can write the book. I can only think and uh, write, but to publish, to edit, to uh, do many other things that is you have to involve more people and everybody cannot give the same priority as you give because for you it is a product for them it is a work and there is a lot of difference because basically it is a commitment that you need a product has a commitment if i make a product i have a commitment but one who is taking it as a work for him it is just like any other work So if he has time, he will do it. If he doesn't have time, he will not do it. So I think patience and perseverance uh, took me through. It took long, but it's okay. So nowadays, a lot of dancers go through probably like having anxiety and depression. Do you think that is something that can be cured? Yes, you can. Usually, when you know they share about this with their parents or family, they just say meditation for the people. So. I don't think so. That is the answer. No, it's absolutely wrong. That's why I said mystery of meditation is a type. People have wrongly understood meditation. You see, focusing. Uh, let me explain it in a very simple way. To focus on a moving thing is difficult. For a short time, you can focus. For example, if there is a clock moving in a pendulum way, you can focus on it. You can tell a child. focus on it going up and down or going sideways you can focus on it you are playing um, football and you say focus on the ball right that's dynamic focus uh dynamic focus is easier uh, because your mind is moving mind is always moving so when it is in motion the body is motion and then the mind is more focused it can focus but when you are still then control the mind and focus on anything is very difficult because body can be still but mind is always always it's running the more you want to hold it the more it gets away from you so uh, meditation so we start teaching how to focus then how to concentrate first you start focusing on an outside object then you choose an object on yourself then you choose an object within yourself which is still more difficult and then you choose an object which doesn't exist concentrate on void or con- concentrate on a concept somebody says okay meditate on laughter tough one it takes long time to come to that stage and um sometimes it can take in one sitting maybe even 10 hours and that kind of endurance not many people have but more important is that if at all by any chance of fluke also you reach that stage where you can hold the mind completely at stand still and create a thoughtless state it generates profuse energy in you and uh, if your system is not strong enough to provide the sink to that energy that it can absorb then you can damage yourself and that's why you'll find that many people who try to start yoga as a meditation or meditation as a yoga um, they may end up into damaging themselves in certain cases they have lost their lives as well so how to advise this is wrong thing 
go first first make your body strong through your conduct through your uh, values through your asanas and then you come to pranayam and then you can move further and further it's a step by step there is no jump in yoga there is no jump there is no high jump and long jump it's just one continuous process and that's what i have tried to do in this book and very as simple as it possible i i have tried to explain to the people just go step by step feel be your own master be your own teacher it has an automatic auto correction mechanism it will it will teach you everything it will teach you don't eat it no matter how how good it is but once you will start practicing it will say no it's not needed so wrong thing i'm taking so that's it so i think can be a very brilliant job for some Not just write in one book, the entire book, right? Sometimes you get ideas and you write for like hours, and sometimes you just write two lines and you're done. So, how did you balance that? It's tough. It's really tough. Yeah, I have done so many writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, and sometimes you get fed up. I said one, I said. So, but I'd say yeah, it's a tough job. particularly to write something that can be acceptable to the people not just to yourself um in, you know in you collective validation is not possible because yoga is very subjective only those who do it know the benefit of it uh, therefore collective validation is just not possible in yoga in the ultimate stage of that uh so what one can do best is share your experiences detail down the methodology that you have adopted and share what experiences you pass through basic ones and let the reader feel that let me also pick up and see and practice and he can match up that is he passing through the similar experiences or he may have a different experience maybe he has much better experience then he can share his own so this is what i will say so i was taught that everybody has a role model and then i was taught that you have a role model for every instance in your life so like you're living a normal life you have a role model for being a writer you have a role model who is your role model as a writer I won't say a role model as a writer uh, because I don't belong to that category of very high intellectual uh, um, ingredient in me. Uh, but I have read uh, quite a number of books on, besides my own subjects uh, of science and engineering and uh, general behavioral pattern uh, of economics. um i've read a lot of books on philosophy particularly eastern philosophy and uh western philosophy is very little to contribute to be honest most of it is borrowed and interpreted um but i've read a lot of books on uh, science like button to sail um uh, fritz of uh, tau of physics is one of the best books that i've seen in the modern times uh is stephen hawkins Uh, I would uh, say in-depth books, and on yoga, um, I'm indebted to B.K. Sahib. He, I have liked the way he has explained in depth the philosophy and practice of yoga. So that's all. So, but I don't think I have a role model. Uh, I don't have a role model. I wish I could. Uh, if you want. ask me to do i have any role model i won't answer that my father or mother because i lost them when i was very young but in political scenario i'd say my role model would be gandhi in political so she pulled out i also as a reader like i am a reader myself and if somebody asks what is your favorite it's a very difficult question for me to answer can you answer this 
not really, not really. It's uh, I have never read anything from uh, from that angle, but. I would love that everybody read Bhagavad Gita not just as a book pronounced by the so-called assumed Hinduism, Hindu philosophy that it is a God himself that has said it, irrespective of who has said it, irrespective of which religion you belong to, which faith you follow, read Gita because it's you know that Gita is 700 shlokas, right? And most of them are two-liners. On today's, the kind of book that you have in your hand, all this can be contained in 35 pages, right? 35 pages. But there are commentaries which run into thousands of pages, which I believe, to, my, to me, it is diluting you, uh, Gita. Because if you cannot understand Gita the way it has been spoken, then you cannot understand Gita through volume of explanation. Then it is, then it is not a word of God. Either we are fooling ourselves or we are not understanding Gita at all. A good book, a good word, can be understood in one go. And Gita is very simple. Everything is so simple and so clear. There is, there is no doubt about it. When he says, Sarvadharam Paritajya, Maamekam Saranam Braja. When he has taught everything, Arjuna is still divided. I said, but which one should I follow? You are talking of karma yoga, jnana yoga, sankhya yoga, bhakti yoga. Which one you follow? He said, none. Just do your karma and surrender unto me. Sarva dharma parita. Mame ekam saranam That is the ultimate of yoga. Where you have surrendered all your experiences, all your ex achievements, all your ego gone, then you become a part of God. That state of surrender is not easy. That is why I said meditation is a very ultimate state. The, you can see this even in Patanjali Astyo, where at the end he says, Purushartha Shanyanam Gunanam Pratiprasava. Whatever you push out, whatever you have in your achievement, make it zero. Not zero just by saying it, but through your mental conscious exercise. That is where you say spiritual consciousness. You are nothing. All my achievements. People ask me about my past, I said, I have forgotten. I can remember, but I don't carry it. So that is the ultimate thing about yoga, real yoga. Total surrender. Total surrender. Those who can do it, they can achieve anything. Do your, do your duty. Before we end this interview, there is one question that has been going since we started explaining. And that was, do you think in future, there will be a world where there will be peace, mental peace within each human. I, you see, the values, time has its own characteristics. And uh, like morning is, in, in, in 24 hours, you have a morning, you have a midday, you have a setting sun, you have a evening, then you have a night, then early morning hours. So each, each time frame has its own characteristics. Similarly, on a broader classification of time, particularly if you go by Hinduism, uh, then there are four yugas, Sadjuk, Treta, Dwapar, Kaljuk, and they go by cycle. And uh, one yuga is 432,000 years. 
right? One of all the four yugas combined is known as Chatur Yuga, which means 4.32 billion years. And one Chatur Yuga is one day of Brahma. So, but the significance is not the figure. The significance is the time that I have classified. Sadjuk, Dwapar, Tirtha, Kalju. So each period has its significance. That this is the period which will have this value. Like Satyug had the knowledge value, Jnan value. Dwapar had Jnan, but it was diluting a little and it came to Tap. And Treta Yug, Jnan was almost vanishing. Tap was also giving way to uh, Karma. So that is what he teaches in Gita. And Kalju is all black. No moral principles will be there, nothing will be there. So, but the loss will be gradual, not that immediately. There will be still some good people uh, who will carry this earth beyond. But gradually you will find there will be more and more um, uh, violence in thought process. Money will play a much important role than anything else. Uh, but then it will reverse. It will reverse. But when, I cannot tell you. Every, every violence must end in peace. Every violence. But do you, it is surprising, I've mentioned in my book, that the most precious book like Gita, the pronunciation of it was made in a battlefield. A teaching and preaching on peace and prosperity was done by convincing somebody that you fight a war and the most fierce war. So war sometimes becomes a necessity. It is not an option. So not, nobody should be bothered about it. Uh, if it is to happen, it will happen. If it is not to happen, it will never happen. But after every war, there will be peace. Okay? Thank you so much, sir, for giving us such a small time in your entire day. And talking to you has made me realize a lot of things. Thank you. Like, Thank you. I understood a lot of things. And to everyone who's watching this, this book, Quantum Yoga and History of Meditation, is out from our Lipka, Amazon, and the IP stores. I would suggest you to buy it because I would like you to watch this, understand this, what we meant by everything that we said, and get influenced in such a positive way. I love it. Thank you so much everybody for watching. I hope you have a good day.